Hello, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this public lecture hosted here at Queen's University Belfast by the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. I'm Richard English, the Director of the Mitchell Institute. You're all very welcome and it's a real privilege for me to introduce our distinguished lecturer today. Dr. Sudhir Hazarizing has been Fellow and Tutor in Politics at Balliol College, Oxford since 1990. Fellow of the British Academy, Dr. Hazarizing has written powerfully, compellingly and influentially about French cultural and intellectual history. His books, including In the Shadow of the General, Modern France and the Myth of de Gaulle, The Legend of Napoleon and How the French Think. His works have deservedly brought him many prizes and honours, including the winning of the prestigious Wolfson History Prize in 2021 for the book about which he'll be speaking to us tonight, Black Spartacus, The Epic Life of Toussaint Louverture. After Dr. Hazirizing's lecture, there'll be the chance for you to ask questions. And so do please post those through the question and answer function on the screens in front of you, and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can. So dear, it's great to welcome you today to Queen's and to the Mitchell Institute, and it's my real pleasure now to hand over to Dr. Sudhir Azarizing. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much for that warm and generous introduction. And uh, it's a really great honor and privilege for me to be with you today. And, and thank you to everyone who is attending um, this lecture. Um, I'm going to start by just saying a little bit about Toussaint Louverture and uh, just give you a kind of thumbnail sketch of who he was and, and what he achieved just very quickly for those of you who may not know too much about um, that moment in, uh, uh, in our modern history. Um, and then I want to say something about why this is an important story um, and why it's a story that matters for us um, up, to this, up to this point, up to today. Then I'll pick, um, rather than just talk only about Toussaint, he was the main actor in one of the big revolutions of the late 18th and early 19th century. And I want to pick on a number of big themes that emerge out of those revolutions and which Toussaint Louverture's own life and actions and way of thinking uh, exemplify. So it'll be really through Toussaint Louverture telling, uh, uh, raising some of these important big issues, um, which tell us a lot about uh, the importance of um, this revolution, um, which Toussaint was one of the leaders of. And then I'll conclude with some thoughts about how the story really continues to engage with us um, in our contemporary world, in, in, in the way we think about ourselves, in the way we think about our history, and indeed in the way that we think about our politics. So that's the broad agenda for um, the next 40 minutes or so. So who was Toussaint Louverture? Um, he was a late 18th century national liberator. Uh, he was born on what was called the French colony of Saint-Domingue in the Caribbean. Saint-Domingue was the wealthiest uh, 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 French colony um, uh, of, of, of that period. Um, it was known as the Pearl of the Antilles. It produced um, fabulous wealth for um, local settlers as well as um, uh, merchants and investors who were based in France. It produced large amounts of sugar, coffee, cocoa, indigo, um, and um, all of this wealth um, was based, however, on um, the labor of enslaved men and women. And the simple statistic that sums this up is that by 1789, by the time of the French Revolution, you have uh, a population of Saint-Domingue, which consists of about 30,000 uh, European or white settlers, around 30, 35,000 uh, mixed race people, and 500,000 enslaved men and women, the majority of whom were born um, in Africa, right, in, in the late 18th century. So we're talking about a fabulously wealthy colony, but that fabulous wealth is based on enslavement. And that, really is uh, the main thing you need to know before we can dive into the story of Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint Louverture, for the first 50 years of his life, he, was, he lived on a plantation in the north of Saint-Domingue. 
And in 1791, the enslaved people revolt um, in Saint-Domingue. I mean, they wait patiently for two years after the French Revolution, hoping that these great principles of liberty and equality and fraternity that have been promised to everyone are going to be given to them too. But of mm. course, the revolution doesn't do anything for the enslaved men and women. So they take matters into their own hands. And Toussaint Louverture then joins this uh, uh, rebellion, which becomes really the, which is really the, the beginnings of the, the, the Haitian revolution, as, as we will uh, come to call it. And uh, he becomes a, 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 a great campaigner for emancipation, the emancipation of uh, the enslaved. And basically, thanks to his leadership and um, the fighting spirit of these uh, men and women who have revolted, the French, the local French authorities are forced to recognize the uh, uh, freedom of the enslaved in 1793. And this is the prelude to 1794, the abolition of slavery passed by the French National Assembly, the Convention. From that moment on, Toussaint Louverture has a sort of meteoric ascension. Um, he becomes uh, a general in the French Republican army. He takes on the other uh, foreign imperial forces that are based in Saint-Domingue. Saint-Domingue is, because it's fabulously wealthy, um, attracts the um, uh, uh, greed uh, of all the local imperial powers. Uh, the Spaniards, the British, uh, the Americans are also uh, around and I'll talk about them a little later. But basically Toussaint eliminates all these uh, groups. Um, he also sidelines the French envoys who are, who the success, successive French governments basically try and contain Toussaint Louverture. And so they, they dispatch these kind of hapless bureaucrats who are, uh, 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 eliminated in a very delicate way by, by Louverture. He kind of uh, sees to it that, they, that they're not able to kind of exercise their functions. So that by the late 1790s, Toussaint Louverture has become the dominant political figure uh, in the politics of Saint-Domingue. He uses this dominance to establish uh, strong political and commercial links with uh, the neighbors and with the United States. And the climax of his rule comes in 1801 when uh, Toussaint Louverture promulgates a Republican constitution, which basically appoints him as governor for life and uh, reinforces the, the abolition of slavery, which, which had already been um, uh, legislated upon in, in 1794. Basically, this constitution affirms that slavery is abolished uh, forever. And the constitution basically makes Saint-Domingue an autonomous entity within the French uh, uh, colonial empire although the word autonomy isn't actually used, but the spirit of the constitution is actually uh, uh, driven by this idea of, of autonomy. Unfortunately, by then, Napoleon has become the ruler of France and Napoleon was not someone who cared very much for anyone's autonomy. So um, he and Toussaint end up um, squaring, squaring up to each other. Uh, uh, attempts at, media, at mediation between them fail. And in 1802, Napoleon sends an, an invading fleet um, basically to recapture, uh, uh, restore white rule in, in the colony and eliminate uh, the black leadership under Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint is captured in 1802 uh, and exiled in France where he dies uh, the following year. But his lieutenants, um, all the people that he has trained um, under him in the uh, Republican army of Saint-Domingue, take up the struggle, um, wage a war of national liberation against the French. And uh, in, at the end of 1803, at the Battle of Vertier in November 1803, the French invaders are defeated um, and they withdraw from the colony of Saint-Domingue. And in 1804, um, the independent state of Haiti is proclaimed by Toussaint's former lieutenant, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Toussaint is no longer there because he, uh, he, has, uh, he has died in the previous year. But I think in light of this very quick summary, I think we can safely say that the new Haitian state the newly independent state of Haiti um, 
has Toussaint Louverture as one of its um, founding fathers. So Toussaint Louverture, as you can see from this very quick summary, he was um, a, a constitutional thinker, he was a warrior, he was a national liberator, um, he was a, a, a nation builder, he's someone who brings um, uh, the people of Saint-Domingue together, aspires to bring them together and forge forge, forge a nation, as it were. And uh, just as importantly, last but not least, given that um, I have the pleasure of speaking at the George Mitchell um, Institute, um, Toussaint Louverture was a peacemaker. He was someone who was, who was committed and dedicated throughout his life to try to bring together groups that had been um, either uh, antagon had antagonistic social relations with each other or had actually been at war with each other. And that aspect of his life is something that I'll also talk about. So that in a nutshell is the Toussaint Louverture story. As you can see, it is a story that is completely um, intertwined with um, the story of the Haitian revolution. And, and Toussaint Louverture is, I think, without doubt, um, the principal leader of this revolution. And so I think um, uh, what I want to do now is just very quickly to uh, 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 say something about why this is a, an important story. I mean, it's an, it's an important story in and of itself, and, and, I'll, and I'll come to that in a moment, but it has some wider implications, um, which I think are interesting to uh, just briefly touch upon. And I think there's three, um, three, three things that I'd like to say here about the, the wider importance of this story. The first is that this is a story which highlights and restores the agency of Black people um, and their contributions to the freedoms that we enjoy today. Um, I've always been very struck by the fact that we talk a lot, um, we talk, we talk uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in our universities and in our public lives about the importance of democracy and the importance of equality. And these are values, of course, that we all hold very dear. But sometimes we forget the origins um, of some of these uh, important values. And I think the enormous contribution of the enslaved men and women of Saint-Domingue to the history of democracy, to the history of equality, is something that um, for a long time uh, hasn't been sufficiently acknowledged. And, and there's another uh, related theme here, which is the, um, the struggle by um, enslaved men and women against um, the, their enslavement. Uh, the, the Haitian Revolution is sometimes described as the world's only successful um, slave revolution. And indeed, I've sometimes used that expression myself. Um, I think it, it, it's an unfortunate expression because it, it sometimes gives the impression, or at least it implies, that somehow these were the only enslaved men and women who resisted and revolted, and everyone else simply accepted their condition passively. And so in that sense, I think it's misleading because resistance uh, to enslavement is absolutely endemic to the condition of, uh, of the slaves. From We now know, thanks to uh, the wonderful work that social historians of slavery have carried out over the past 15, 20 years, that enslaved men and women resisted from the moment they were captured. They resisted during the... Uh, 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 terrible uh, uh, crossing that they endured uh, over the Atlantic in these terrible ships that carried them over um, to, to the New World. Um, and they resisted and fought in a number of different ways um, uh, when they ended up in these plantations in the Caribbean and in the United States. Um, and indeed, the backdrop to the story of the Haitian Revolution is actually um, that um, you had uh, 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 revolts, rebellions, insurrections uh, around all the way around the Caribbean, um, in the United States as well. But you know, in places like Jamaica, Venezuela, Cuba, um, people were revolting throughout the second half of the 18th century. And, and so the fact that uh, the Haitian Revolution has this particular trajectory that ends in the creation of an independent state should not um, uh, 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 lead us away from the, this wider 
uh, context of struggle. Indeed, <clears throat> um, I think the uh, the experience of these other experiences played uh, a, a defining role in, in in enabling and in making possible um, the revolution in Saint Domingue itself. And I think there are particular reasons why um, the 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 Haitian Revolution took the path that it did, and and uh, uh, <clears throat> maybe we can we can discuss this uh, a little further in the question and answer if you're interested. But I think the this isn't an isolated um, revolt. That's the basic first point I want to make. Right, this is about a, a comprehensive attitude of rebelliousness and uh, revolution uh, on the part of the enslaved men and women. I also think, secondly, this is a really important story because um, we need, um, for a long time, and, and I hinted at it already in, in, in my opening remarks, for a long time, the story of um, these uh, brave revolutionaries was uh, hidden from us uh, deliberately by um, by the dominant historiography in the Western world. And I'm now talking about the way history has been uh, uh, narrated and, and, and talked about um, in, uh, in Europe and in the United States. Well, for a long time, we have to use the, uh, this word because I think it, it captures it very well. Uh, the story of the Haitian revolution was erased uh, and the story of the, these black revolutionaries was erased from historical consciousness. Erasure um, can take a number of different forms. This too is something that we could uh, we could we could talk about. But I think it's some combination of denial, um, denaturing, uh, relativizing, um, but basically um, uh, 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 making uh, every effort to uh, reduce the or downplay the significance of the phenomenon. And and in this sense, one of the fundamental ambitions of my book was really to restore Toussaint Louverture's own voice, because I think one of the things that we really need to hear loud and clear is the voice of these uh, men and women who were fighting against slavery uh, and fighting against colonialism in the 18th century. And I was very fortunate, of course, in this respect, that Toussaint has left uh, a magnificent archive you know, all a lot of his letters, a lot of his reports, a lot of his uh, uh, instructions as a, as a French military officer, all of this, all of this material was sitting for the most part in the French colonial archives. And I was able to draw upon them to reconstruct um, Toussaint Louverture's, uh, really to see, to try and see the world through his eyes. And, and that's what I really try to do in the book. And, and I think we need more of those sort of voices when, when, we're, when we're thinking about the history of uh, enslavement and the history of colonialism. For a long time, for too long, those histories have been told from the point of view of the powerful, from the point of view of uh, the colonial administrators, from the point of view of the slave owners, um, because we have much more, many more sources uh, and many more documents about these. Um, but the for the again for the past um, 15 20 years um, there's now been a very welcome turnaround in the historiography and a real effort is now being made to try and tell these stories from the point of view of um, the people who were at the receiving end and, and who were resisting slavery and colonialism and in this sense Toussaint Louverture is absolutely um, exemplary because he uh, he's someone who grew up as a as an enslaved person, um, but then ended up taking uh, uh, taking up arms against the institution and and defeating it. Thirdly, uh, and finally, and I've already mentioned this, but I'll uh, just spend a, a half a minute talking about it again. Um, this is a big story because it's a story of a peacemaker, and. You have to imagine how extraordinary it is for a man born into slavery, a man who saw his own relatives sold into slavery um, uh, by people um, who were uh, 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 running the plantation, uh, for such a man to um, uh, become uh, uh, an advocate of peaceful relations among um, former European settlers, mixed race people and, and black people. Um, uh, and that's what Toussaint Louverture's uh, uh, fundamental political project was throughout the 1790s. He wanted to uh, 
Uh, not to forget, uh, you know, it was never about forgetting because he always knew that these terrible things had happened, but um, to try and move past um, these conflicts and to create what uh, we would today call a, a multiracial republic um, in a, a, a political community that had been torn apart for over a century by racial conflict. And in that sense, I think his legacy was not just extraordinary um, in its own time, it's a legacy that still speaks to us um, today. And, and, I'll, and I'll come back to that um, at the end of my talk. So these are the three big, bigger reasons why I think this is a really important story. Now, let me zoom back into uh, uh, the Haitian Revolution itself and to Saint Louverture and try and draw out some of the big themes that I think uh, are, are, are of interest to us as, as students and, and observers of this period. Why is this such, a, such an important moment uh, uh, to talk about? I think there's five areas that I want to, to say something about. One is the, um, the revolutionary uh, activities of, uh, of the Haitians themselves compared to the French and the American revolutions. Um, I want to talk a bit more about slavery, secondly. I want to talk about race, thirdly. Um, this is a, a revolution where race plays an absolutely um, fundamental role. I want to talk about leadership because of course Louverture is a leader and I think it's interesting to try and think about what kind of leader he was. And finally, I want to say something about his republicanism, because he was also a republican leader and someone who believed very passionately in the republican principles of um, liberty, equality and fraternity, but he gave them uh, a twist of his own, uh, a, a flavor of his own. And I think that that particular characteristic of his republicanism is something uh, also very, very interesting and noteworthy. So um, let's start with uh, the age of revolution. And indeed, when I use that expression, uh, one is always, one is already inclined um, to think about um, other revolutions. Until recently, when we used the word age of revolution, we thought about the American and the French revolutions. Indeed, I, in some of my earlier work, before I was exposed to this wonderful story of the Haitian revolution, um, I paid relatively little attention, you know, to my own shame, um, to the Haitian revolutions. That's partly because I, you know, I believe the rhetoric of the French Revolution, which is that, you know, they had uh, carried out this uh, wonderful revolution, which was, um, you know, the most glorious, the most emancipating, the most liberating uh, uh, series of political acts of the epoch. Um, now that I've looked at the revolution in Saint Domingue. The revolution that starts in 1791 and concludes in 1804 with the um, independence of uh, uh, and the creation of the Haitian state, it seems to me that when we think about the age of revolutions, the revolution that we should have in front of us as the exemplar is the Haitian revolution. It is by far, by far, the most comprehensive and the most radical revolution of its age, because it is all at once uh, an anti-imperial revolution, uh, a democratic revolution, because, you know, um, at certain moments, particularly towards the end and, and, and at the beginning, it's basically the entire people, the entire uh, population, black population and, and mixed race population who are fighting against the uh, French invaders. It's a Republican revolution. I'll come back to that point uh, in a moment. Uh, it's a revolution about race and racial equality. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it ends uh, uh, as a war which creates um, a new sovereign state. So when you compare um, what happens in, in Saint-Domingue and Haiti to what happens in America and in France, well, um, you know, it seems to me that Haiti wins hands down. Um, America is a very partial revolution at best, as, as those of you who've studied revolutions comparatively know, you know, <clears throat> scholars like Theda Scotchpole don't even think we should call the American Revolution a revolution. I mean, that's a slightly controversial view, but, you know, her point is that how can you talk about a revolution which does nothing about slavery? 
right? I mean, that's that's the kind of fundamental point. Uh, now, the French Revolution does take the issue of slavery seriously, but only up to 1802, when Napoleon restores slavery um, in uh, uh, the French Empire. So when we look at um, the big themes um, that are being uh, vehicled by these revolutions, the revolution of Saint-Domingue is the richest, it's the most comprehensive, it's the most radical. So if we're interested in revolutions, we should really take this revolution seriously um, and take it seriously uh, for all of these uh, different dimensions that it, uh, that it manifests. Secondly, this is a revolution about slavery. Um, slavery is fundamental to the uh, beginning of the revolution, as, as I've already indicated. But if we roll the camera forward uh, into, the, into the 1790s, and when you look at Toussaint Louverture's strategic objectives, what you see is that throughout this period, as a political leader, he has two fundamental objectives. One is to uh, 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 protect the emancipated status of um, the former enslaved men and women, right? Because there are various attempts by the French, by others to uh, encroach upon this emancipation. So he is the guardian. And, and, and that's really the basis on which his political leadership is, is, is supported by the overwhelming majority of the population. He is the guardian of uh, emancipation. And from the late 1790s onwards, uh, a related objective of Toussaint's is to protect his people from re-enslavement because he be, it becomes very clear. I mean, he's a, Toussaint is a very careful observer of the French political scene. And even though he's never, he never actually goes to France, tragically, until he's deported there in 1802. But he understood very well the conservative drift of the French Revolution, um, even before Napoleon um, uh, uh, came to power. And he understood that the planters and the, uh, and the merchant classes that had been dispossessed of their slaves by, seven, by the 1794 emancipation were fighting to re restore slavery. And those very powerful interests are, are very um, important, play a very important role in bringing Napoleon to power and then lobbying him to restore slavery. So Toussaint understands all of this, and therefore he's trying to, throughout this period, he's trying to protect um, his people from re-enslavement. And he's trying to warn the French, basically, saying to them, don't come here, don't try and attack us, because if you do, you will be defeated. And unfortunately, the French don't heed this warning. But what this shows is that the, this entire revolutionary period from 1791 to 1804, including on the French side, should really be seen as a war about slavery. It's a war in which slavery plays an absolutely um, central role. So slavery is really key to understanding um, uh, uh, this, this revolution. Slavery, but also race. And this is my, um, this is my third theme, because of course, slavery uh, is based and can can only be based on a racial hierarchy. Um, indeed, even mixed race people who we sometimes forget actually before the emancipation, many mixed race people uh, owned slaves. Uh, you know, it's estimated that about uh, a quarter of the slaves uh, um, before 1793 were owned by, by mixed race people. But even if they were allowed to own slaves, these mixed race people did not have full, did not enjoy full civil and political rights under the system of slavery, because they could only be uh, one set of rulers, one uh, 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 one top class, and that was um, that was the the white community, and so. Um, Toussaint's entire political project is, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of negative aspect to it, which is to oppose slavery. But now I want to say something about the, the positive aspect. What does he want to replace slavery with? This is where the absolutely key concept of brotherhood or fraternité comes into play. And it's a word that Toussaint Louverture uses um, repeatedly, comprehensively. 
throughout his uh, throughout his uh, writings, in his speeches, um, uh, in his private correspondence, and brotherhood for him is really uh, uh, has two overlapping uh, uh, aspects. On the one hand, um, uh, Toussaint is very conscious that um, the black community, um, you know, these men and women uh, who he's leading into battle and um, uh, after 1794, these these men and women who are the sit free citizens of the of the new republican order, that actually um, historically, ethnically, religiously, these are people who are very divided from each other. Um, you might remember at the beginning, I mentioned that um, si around 60% of the enslaved men and women of Saint-Domingue had been born in Africa. Now, they weren't born in the same part of Africa. Some of them came from Central Africa, others came from Western Africa, some came from coastal regions, others came from uh, uh, regions that were more, more inland. Um, but basically, these were people who were very different from each other. They spoke different languages. Um, and indeed, they often uh, had histories of uh, antagonisms towards each other. So one of the fundamental uh, objectives of Toussaint is to build um, a sense of common purpose among these uh, black men and women. And what is extraordinary, extraordinary, given that you know we're only talking about uh, a few years, is that you can see that by the late 1790s, this unity is, is already in place, right? Um, I mean, <clears throat> it, it, it's quite a strong term to say that Toussaint is a nation builder, but, but that's, that is his ambition, right? He takes um, these people who are divided from each other, uh, 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 and 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 of course, the, the whole purpose of slavery was to was to break the spirit of these men and women. And he he basically forges a political alliance among them, but not just among the black community, because the other prong of his uh, policy of fraternity is to bring together um, the, the former white settlers. Uh, and former slave owners um, and the mixed race people. And uh, brotherhood means also um, getting uh, the three different components of Saint-Domingue to work together hand in hand and uh, uh, live uh, along on the basis of the principles of Republican um, equality uh, and fraternity. So this is really uh, an unprecedented project, first of all, of course, there's no, no nowhere else is this, uh, this kind of project being even entertained, let alone put into practice. And this is why um, the Haitian revolution under Louverture is very special. Indeed, what happens in Haiti after independence is rather different um, from this Louverturian vision, because of course, when Dessalines uh, uh, proclaims independence, one of the things he does very quickly is to eliminate physically um, uh, all, there's about 1,500 uh, uh, white settlers who were still in the colony at the time, and he kills them um, because he believes that um, white people can't be trusted. I mean, the vast majority of them uh, uh, had aligned with the French invaders. So he came to the conclusion that uh, a free and democratic and Republican Haiti um, would have to be a Haiti in which there were only black people and mixed race people. There was no place for white people in, in that vision. But for Louverture, um, right up to the end, Toussaint believes that this, this multiracial republic is one that um, uh, should be maintained and could be maintained. And that is uh, really quite remarkable. And on the other side, um, uh, you know, race plays an absolutely central role in in Napoleon's own thinking. And uh, when you look at the, the the reasons why he is so aggressive towards Saint Domingue, um, it is about race. It is about restoring white rule. Um, it's about uh, eliminating um, the black elite. And and so uh, it's not just a racial revolution, but there's an anti race anti egalitarian counter revolution. Um, that goes hand in hand with this. Um, and uh, I mean, again, I'm happy to talk about it further if, if there are questions, but um, when, when Napoleon um, 
restores slavery in 1802. He also bans black and mixed race people from entering metropolitan territory. Um, so this is about race, right? Race isn't just incidental, right? Um, race is a fundamental part um, of the story. Um, fourthly, this is about leadership, of course. I've been talking in, in general terms about Toussaint and about um, uh, all the things that he did uh, surrounded by, uh, by his supporters and his officers and his soldiers. But in a very fundamental sense, um, I think, um, you know, if one asks the question, well, let me go back to one of the one of the questions I hinted at earlier, which is why why is there this successful trajectory in Haiti and in Saint Domingue, whereas um, revolts and insurrections in in other parts of the Caribbean or in South America were less successful? Let's put it like that. But I think leadership is a very important factor here. Um, uh, Toussaint was able to provide. Um, uh, the enslaved men and women of Saint-Domingue with um, uh, uh, a, a form of leadership which was extraordinarily effective. Why is it so effective? Firstly, because he has charisma. Um, charisma is something very difficult to, to define. Um, you, you see it just when you see the reaction of people to him. And if ever there was evidence was needed that charisma is not physical. You know, Toussaint Louverture is, is the example of it because he was thin, uh, uh, wiry, uh, um, hard, he hardly ate, by the way, you know. Uh, he ate like a, a few vegetables and a few pieces of cheese during the day. He didn't drink any alcohol. Um, uh, his appearance was very unprepossessing, but if he suddenly started talking, I mean, he could just silence a whole crowd, a whole room. Uh, with one look, um, he could just transform the way people uh, connected with him. So he has this charisma, but he also has extraordinary skills. And I think um, the key point to make here about his leadership is that he's all at the same time, all at once, a military leader, uh, an administrative leader, and a diplomatic leader. Um, uh, one of the many extraordinary aspects of this story is that uh, this man who had grown up for the first 50 years of his life on a plantation from the mid 1790s onwards starts to play very complex, almost kind of Machiavellian diplomatic games with the French, with the Americans, with the Spaniards and with the British as well. And basically, um, outfoxes, outsmarts, all of them, um, in order to get Saint-Domingue to the position where he wants it to be, which is, uh, you know, still part of the French Empire, but being able to trade um, freely with the British and with the Spaniards and with the Americans. And in order to do that, he has to, um, you know, do all the kind of devious things that diplomats did uh, in that period. But what is striking is how quickly this completely unschool, unschooled um, person in the art of diplomacy, how quickly he, 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 he rises to the challenge. And as I say, is actually better at this game than um, all these diplomats who had spent you know, years and, and decades uh, practicing their art. So um, this leadership of his was uh, remarkable. And I think, um, Perhaps the most extraordinary thing is just the breadth of the coalition that supports him. And you can see it by the late 1790s. This is a man who is, is adored, um, idolized by the white settlers, right? I mean, they, they, they think of him as a divinity um, all the way across to um, the former enslaved men and women who also think of him as someone who has extraordinary powers. So, uh, and everything in between, um, he enjoys massive support from as well. But to be able to create a coalition of that kind and hold it together requires, uh, I think is, is evidence of really remarkable skills. And, and I think it's really this emphasis on reconciliation and national unity, which is really important here and which is a key part of his leadership. And in that sense, although I'm now jumping forward very quickly, um, uh, he does remind me a lot of Mandela. 
and 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 the way that he approaches reconciliation, uh, uh, that spirit of forgiveness, is very much like Mandela. And of course, the other uh, 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 analogy with Mandela, which applies also to to Louverture, is that he basically lets the former white elite keep their economic um, power and privilege. And this is something that is controversial. It's something that Toussaint was attacked for and is still attacked for um, by by some people who think that he was too close to them, uh, that he allowed them too much power. Um, But for him, it was very clear that um, uh, 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 an independent, not not independent, but an autonomous Saint-Domingue, which was uh, economically prosperous, needed um, the skills uh, of the former settlers. And that's why he thought that it was absolutely essential that they should be, uh, uh, that they should remain uh, uh, in the colony and continue to contribute to its, to its wealth. So that's an important part of this Louverture vision and an important part of his leadership. Finally, uh, the fifth uh, uh, big theme that I wanted to just briefly talk about is uh, republicanism. And in a way, I've already been hinting at it all along, but I just want to pull it all together um, uh, under one heading. And what is really striking about Louverture is not just that he is a Republican, because we had lots of Republicans, people talking about uh, uh, Republican values in the age of revolution. You know, we had them in France, we had them in, uh, uh, in, in America, we have them uh, uh, in Ireland, we have them in, uh, uh, in South America, Bolivar. Um, so Republicanism is, is a political movement, a political philosophy. Um, which is emerging at this time in, 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 the, in the age of enlightenment. And Toussaint Louverture, I think, sometimes has been perhaps mischaracterized as just a, a disciple of the enlightenment. So when people think about the Haitian revolution and, and, and its intellectual origins, as it were, um, there's a, until recently, the dominant tendency was to see it as an offshoot, if you like, of... Um, of the of the European Enlightenment or the Enlightenment in the Americas, and of course I, I think it's a wonderful book. But C. L. R. James's Black Jacobins is 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 doing something like that. Uh, you can see it in the title, right? Because this is a book about Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution, but its title is, you know, Black Jacobins, meaning these are Caribbean Frenchmen. Right. So the idea is that all the intellectual energy that is coming into uh, the Haitian Revolution is coming from France. Now, there's no denying that some of that energy did come from France. But actually, when you look at that decade and the early 1800s, you see that more often than not, the French are impeding the Haitians. (laughs) They're trying to contain their attempts to emancipate themselves. the most radical moment in the French Revolution is 1793 and 1794, and and by that point, the Haitian Revolution is only is only just getting going. Once you move into the second half of the 1790s, um, the French are turning increasingly towards counter-revolution. So, the Haitian Revolution is actually something else, um, and that something else is is represented by Louverture. So where does he get the, his ideas from? He gets it, first of all, from a very radical and rich tradition, anti-slavery tradition in Saint-Domingue itself. You know, as I was saying to you earlier, um, enslaved people were resisting um, from the early 18th century. And, and there were various moments in, in the history of Saint-Domingue when those traditions uh, expressed themselves in uh, uh, in forms of rebellions and insurrections. And and Toussaint draws from those traditions, but he also draws from his Catholicism, from his identification with uh, the Taino people, the the native people uh, of the colony, and from the Vodou religion, which is the the sort of national religion already uh, in the making um, of the Haitian people. And um, at the same time, and this too has been uh, ignored for too long, Toussaint Louverture is a proud son of Africa. Um, 
you know, he's just one generation down from uh, from Africa. His father was someone who he he, he talked to uh, and uh, 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 learned a lot from uh, in in his youth. And his father was someone who had military, um, scientific, and cultural uh, uh, skills that he passed on to his son. And those skills are also skills that he uses in. First of all, skills that um, go into making up who he is, as it were, but also skills that he deploys in in his politics and and in his, and in his administration. So I think when we think about the republicanism of the Haitian Revolution, it's better characterized as a, a Creole republicanism, a, a, a blend, a, a kind of original blend, which sort of brings together. I think the the best of what Europe, um, Asia, and uh, and the Caribbean uh, have to offer, and and Louverture himself is someone who um, uh, symbolizes this blend very well. And indeed, his name is a very good uh, uh, instance of that because um, when he takes that name Louverture in 1793. It is both at the same time a nod to the Enlightenment because ouverture means opening. So it's it's about opening one's mind to, to reason and to and to enlightenment. But in the emerging Vodou religion, um, one of the uh, 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 one of the most uh, uh, well-known spirits is someone called Legba, Papa Legba, and he's the guardian of the crossroads. And his role is to allow you to make the transition from your old life to your better, to your new better one. Um, and so when Toussaint is picking that name, he's also speaking to, to his own constituency, as it were, people who've never heard of the Enlightenment, who don't speak French, but who understand that this is going to be a revolution that is going to be about empowerment and uh, 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 creating uh, something new and original. So. Toussaint's republicanism and the republicanism of these former enslaved men and women, I think is something uh, really interesting and worth, worth taking seriously. So um, that's, those are some of the really big stories, um, themes that I wanted to dwell on. Um, if I just have one more minute, is that all right, Richard, um, to wrap up? Um, I would say that this is also a story that speaks to us in our present, um, because of course we're living in times where um, post we're surrounded by debates about um, post-colonial uh, issues, whether it's uh, reparations, how we commemorate uh, the history of slavery or the history of colonialism, and I think it's very important to think back to. Um, to this period and uh, uh, think about the, the tremendous contributions that people like Toussaint Louverture made uh, uh, to the emancipation uh, of, uh, of slaves. But of course, this is also a story about um, civil and political rights, social justice, and the fight for equality and dignity. And um, I was very touched when uh, an American colleague uh, told me that when he went on one of the marches in, in the United States after the killing of George Floyd, he saw some people waving uh, a Haitian flag. Um, and, and in that sense, I think um, Toussaint Louverture is very much a, a spiritual ancestor of the Black Lives Matter movement. So on that note, I'll say thank you very much and hand back to you, Richard. Sudhir, thank you very much indeed. What a brilliant lecture. Uh, we now move to question and answer and questions are flowing in uh, to the audience. Do keep them coming in and we'll try and get through as many of those Sudhir, as possible. First question is this, thanks for a brilliant talk and a superb book. Could you perhaps elaborate on how such an extensive archival record for Toussaint Literature survived? Do we know? Um, well, I was um, I was startled really because um, uh, I expected to see some things, given that he was uh, both uh, an administrator and a civilian administrator, as it were, and he and he ends up being governor. 
and a general in the in the French Republican army. So you have, in a sense, two sets of records, right? Um, uh, civil and military. Um, but you also have, I should say, one of the uh, many striking individual characteristics of Louverture is that he was a, an avid letter writer. He had, at the height of his power, he had five secretaries working for him, and he would be dictating letters to all five of them at the same time. So you would be producing something like two, three hundred letters every day. Um, sadly, just a tiny fraction of these have survived, but there's still, you know, about 1,500 letters. And they, they are scattered all over, in about 50, 60 different locations, and I made it my mission to track them all down. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so this was, this was a labor of love because it took me to, um, you know, many different archival locations in France, but also in Britain, in Spain, in the United States, um, in the Caribbean. And, and these letters are, are, as I say, dotted all over the place. But it's an incredibly rich um, collection. Um, and, and, and there probably are more things to, to, to uncover. Um, I mean, especially these letters, um, more of them will emerge now, hopefully, that people are paying a bit more attention to, to Toussaint Louverture. Thanks, Sudhir. The next question, in a way, relates to the labour of love. Uh, what was it that initially motivated you? What was it that initially motivated you to research this man in such depth? Um, thank you. Uh, it's a great question because I've, I've always been interested in two things. One is, I suppose, the uh, uh, leadership. You know, uh, in his introduction, Richard mentioned that I'd written a book called The Shadow in the Shadow of the General, which is about Charles de Gaulle, um, the great French uh, resistance leader and first president of the Fifth Republic. I've also written a book about Napoleon uh, a bit earlier on. Uh, and I'm also interested uh, in my sort of wearing my sort of intellectual history hat in, in thinkers and and the way in which they, uh, Republican thinkers, uh, French Republican thinkers mainly. So um, individuals who um, make a difference have always interested me. Um, at the same time, um, I wanted to, uh, because um, before I wrote this book, I had never really studied in any great detail the history of um, colonialism, or for that matter, the, the history of slavery. And this was something that I'd always wanted to do, not least because uh, I was born in Mauritius, a um, small island in the Indian Ocean, which actually was also a French colony in the late 18th and early 19th uh, century. And so uh, many of these stories about slave resistance were stories that I first heard about um, in a very in a very kind of informal way when I was a kid growing up in Mauritius. Um, but I'd always wanted to find out more about this aspect of um, uh, 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 global history, which is also in part my own history. So Louverture and, and the Haitian Revolution basically allowed all of those different things to come together. Thank you. The question here says, are there one or two lessons from Toussaint Louverture's leadership that you think would be particularly useful to the Haitian state and people in the challenges they confront today? Well, one of the things that Toussaint always stood for was um, unity. And, and of course, um, uh, this is something that has, has, has been increasingly difficult um, in, in modern Haitian politics. Um, but I think the, the problems that Haiti faces are problems that, of course, are partly the legacy of um, uh, uh, corrupt and um, corruption and mismanagement by the Haitian elite. And, and that's a long story that goes back at least to the Duvalier era um, from the second half of the 20th century. But sadly, this is also a story of uh, the negative effects of foreign intervention. You know, um, Haiti, Haiti's entire history as a post-colonial nation is a history that was scarred by foreign invasion, foreign interference. Um, the French, for example, um, levied uh, uh, an indemnity on the independent Haitian state. 
uh, in the 1820s, um, basically forcing them to compensate French plantation owners for their slave losses. And, that, and the French economist Guillaume Piketty has calculated that this basically cost um, around 30 billion euros cost the Haitians 30 billion euros. And they only paid it all back fully by the mid 20th century. So that gives you a, an idea of the kind of impact that this, this uh, external intervention alone uh, had on the Haitians. Um, uh, and, and so if, if, I, if, if, if I could channel Toussaint for a second, and if he was here answering this question, I think where he would take the conversation to is that actually he didn't want independence, right? He thought that actually the most sensible thing for Haiti to do just a brief period after gaining emancipation from slavery was to build up its, its economic and political system under the protection, under the benevolent protection of the French, French empire. He thought that it would be much safer for, for the Haitians to do that. And, and if he had succeeded, if Napoleon hadn't been so disastrously stupid as to send an army that was basically wiped out, um, uh, uh, things might have turned out differently. Next question is one which relates to that, Sadir, in, in that it relates to France. The questioner says, thank you for the insightful lecture. My question is, in the current political climate of France, is it possible for them to pay reparations to Haiti? It's possible. It's unfortunately not likely. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Macron has been very, um, I mean, in one sense, he has done more than um, some of his more recent predecessors in acknowledging that um, France has a real issue uh, with its former colonial empires. Um, and uh, he has tried to uh, put the relationship, for example, with Algeria on uh, on a better footing um, but there's also been a lot of clumsiness um, because Macron um, you know he has this en même temps philosophy so on the one hand um, you know he, he tries to uh, uh, make a good gesture towards um, towards reconciliation basically um, but at at the same time he's also someone who has to speak to uh, a set of constituencies which believes that um, France shouldn't, France has nothing to apologize for. France is the land of the revolution. And, um, and even this question of the debt is one that he, he simply will not, um, will not discuss. And given that we're now in, in a, you know, in the, in the late, very late stages of his presidency and he's facing re-election, this is not something that he's likely to, to touch, I don't think. Um, maybe with some help, he might come back to it um, in his second term. I was pleased when he gave, um, he gave it, uh, it's, it's always anniversary time in France. And this year was um, the bicentenary of Napoleon's uh, something or the other, what was it? Bicentenary of his death. Um, so Napole uh, Macron gave a speech at the Institut where he talked about Napoleon and it wasn't the usual, here's a great man who did all these wonderful things for France. He acknowledged that uh, he had done a terrible thing uh, over slavery and mentioned Toussaint Louverture. I think it's the first time a French president has explicitly talked about Toussaint. So things are moving in the right direction, but there's still a very long way to go before the French can actually take this issue uh, with the seriousness that it deserves. Thanks, Sudhir. A, a two-part question uh, is the next one. Uh, the first part of which is, have you heard about efforts by Danny Glover to make a film about Louverture and the revolution? And then second part, is it fair to argue that Haiti has been punished ever since its inception simply for its founder's audacity? So possible film, and then Haiti paying the cost of its founder's audacity. Uh, yes, I've heard about the Danny Glover film. Um, th th there seems to be some kind of curse because uh, there have been at least three attempts to, to make a movie uh, about Louverture. Um, and you'd have thought it would be almost sort of self-evident, right, um, that uh, such a film should be made. And, 
and I'm hopeful that something good will come. I mean, I don't, I don't want to uh, jinx it, so I won't say any more. But, um, but yes, the Danny Glover project. I know that it was initiated, and then, um, and then put put on hold. Uh, so there is, there is one very bad French uh, sort of TV movie uh, that was made sometime around 2012. Um, uh, but it's just dreadful because the, fr the the producers didn't want to offend any kind of sensibilities. So the way they tell the story of the French invasion and, and Toussaint's capture is quite frankly disgraceful, you know, because, um, it, you know, it, it, it's not at all portrayed for what it really was, uh, a war about slavery and a war about uh, race, you know. It's just told in a, in a kind of romanticized, silly way. So, so there's still a great uh, a great story to be told out there, and a great film to be made out there. So let's hope that uh, that we'll see it um, sooner rather than rather than later. And is did the Haitians pay? Yes, I mean I I think you know my answer to that earlier to the earlier question about reparations uh, forced, you know, imposed upon the Haitians. Um, would suggest to me that, that that was the case. But there is the other side of the story, which is that, uh, and, and I deal with this in the later parts of the book, which is that uh, when you think about the 19th and the 20th century, the, the Haitian Revolution really sits as, as a sort of beacon, uh, both as, an, as a source of inspiration for struggles across the Atlantic world for emancipation. So in, whether it's in the uh, Spanish speaking world or in the United States, you know, the whole battle for emancipation in the United States if you take someone like Frederick Douglass, who's perhaps the, the most eminent um, African-American leader uh, and, and champion of emancipation, in, in almost every speech he gave, wherever he went, Douglass talked about Louverture. I mean, he was absolutely fascinated by him and held him up as an example of moral and political uh, uh, leadership. And, um, and, and, and the same in um, in places like Cuba. So, so th this is a story that inspires a lot of uh, people uh, to continue the struggle um, for emancipation. Um, and in the 20th century, the story continues um, in anti-colonial revolutions, uh, whether they're in the English-speaking world or the French-speaking world. Louverture and the Haitians feature very prominently. So. Um, uh, there's, there's on the one hand the, the very sad story of what happens to the Haitian state, but on the other hand, there is the story of the struggle for emancipation, social justice, racial equality, where the story of the Haitian revolution, not as told by Western historians, but as uh, represented by, um, almost by word of mouth, um, uh, carries on, uh, as I say, right the way through to those people chanting uh, uh, Haiti, Haiti, when they were protesting against the killing of George Floyd. Thanks very much, Sudhir. Next question is, how does Toussaint reconcile his deep commitment to fraternity and egalité with the labour regime here overseas, and which leads to confrontation with former slaves? Ah, good. Thank you for that question. Um, uh, I wanted to briefly mention it in my talk, but I didn't really have time. Um, this isn't an easy period. This isn't a, a, a time when um, Toussaint is able to do um, uh, uh, everything at the speed with which he wants. And, and so basically, when you get to the mid 1790s, here's the basic situation. If you look at the economic agricultural production of Saint-Domingue, and if you take the year 1789 uh, as your baseline, by 1795, everything had collapsed, right? Saint-Domingue was not producing anything anymore, wasn't exporting anything. And therefore, it couldn't import anything either. So just at the moment when Louverture uh, is emerging as a military and political leader, the economic system of the colony has completely collapsed, right? Four years of uh, uh, insurrection uh, have, that, have that consequence. 
So um, the question he faces is, what do we do about this? Now, um, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, some people have suggested that his strategy should have been to take control of the land and, and redistribute it to uh, the Haitian peasantry. Um, he never really thought that that was feasible. Um, uh, and, and he never really thought it was feasible, not so much for, um, as it were, ideological reasons, but simply um, the, the infrastructure was not uh, available to make such a system viable. You know, uh, Saint-Domingue had prospered because um, the system of agricultural production was based on large farm, large, large farming, large scale farming and plantations. And uh, 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 breaking them up would have basically um, brought production down to uh, very uh, uh, limited uh, uh, quantities and the revolution would have been strangled. So his reasoning, I think, is, um, is impeccable from a sort of general, general revolutionary point of view. Now, unfortunately, um, you have to implement that. And it's very hard to ask people who have been enslaved uh, and who have lived a life of enslavement, even if you're paying them wages um, from 1793 uh, onwards, to remain on the plantations. And so from the mid 1790s onwards, you start to see uh, greater levels of absenteeism and, and to some, you know, cracks down. Um, on this very in a very uh, hard and, and indeed harsh way. He reintroduces a, a labor regime which um, has a lot of elements of coercion in it. And, and, and this is the cause of um, uh, uh, not just discontent, but uh, in, in 1801, there's an attempted rebellion against him. Uh, I don't think he felt that there was any alternative um, because the other thing that I should say is that when you look at the, uh, the productivity indexes by 1800, 1801, production in sugar, um, coffee, all, all these all these big uh, 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 commodities have risen up to 60, 70 percent of their um, 1789 levels. So economically, it's a success, but there was undoubtedly a, a, a human and a political cost. Thanks very much, Sudhir. A number of questioners are, are raising um, CLR James's book on Toussaint and asking about what you think of that book, the contribution that it's made, the differences between that book and your own approach and its relevance today in terms of under, understanding Toussaint. So a number of people have, uh, have asked about CLR James. Well, first thing is, um, this is still, in my view, um, a great book about the Haitian revolution. Um, it, it captures the, uh, the, the excitement, the, uh, the the sense of energy of the revolution, like no other book, uh, including my own, has. I mean, because it's written by a revolutionary, right? C.L.R. James wrote this in the 1930s at a time when he was uh, himself involved in anti-colonial revolutionary activity. Um, and it's a book which is about the late 18th century, but also about C.L.R. James's own present. Um, and. And, and, and when he writes the preface to the, the later edition in the early 1960s, he's, he's thinking about anti-colonial revolutions, the anti-colonial revolutions that have started. So um, it's a book that is um, really nourished by that spirit of 20th century anti-colonial and anti-imperialism. And in that sense, I think it is um, it is uh, it is a very good um, uh, study of how uh, the trajectory of the Haitian Revolution continues across the 19th and the 20th centuries. But um, as I said, um, you know, uh, Louverture isn't he, he doesn't fit exactly into this mold. Um, I mean, for one thing, as I, as I think I've said twice now, he didn't want independence. Um, he, he he genuinely believed, you know. He um, and I and I've sometimes been asked this question when I when I talk about this book in France. You know, was he anti-French? Uh, uh, the answer is um, it depends which France you're talking about, right? If if we're talking about the France of 1789 and and of the Revolution and of 
the, the France that abolishes slavery, then absolutely not. On the contrary, you know, he, he, he genuinely uh, identified with, with this France, with this revolutionary France. And, um, uh, and some of the people who are his closest associates in, in Saint-Domingue in the 1790s are, are French Republicans, you know, white French Republicans. So he, this is real stuff for him. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, the France that is trying to re-enslave uh, the population of Saint-Domingue, the France that is sending an, an, an invading army to eliminate um, him and his leadership, he doesn't identify with them. So that France, he doesn't like. Um, so in that sense, um, what, what he was trying to do, um, and this is rather different from the project, from where the project has led, has gone to by the mid 20th century, is something rather different. And, and I think uh, C.L.R. James really for ideological reasons, because he was a Marxist and he tended to believe in the in the preeminence, as it were, of European ideas over non-European ideas. I mean, I put it very schematically, but basically that's, that was the, the orthodox, well, he wasn't quite an orthodox Marxist, but you know, that was the general Marxist view in the 20th century. C.L.R. James isn't really interested in, in, in those aspects of Louverture and the Haitian Revolution that I was talking about earlier, and which, which social historians now are paying much more attention to, voodoo, um, spirituality, um, the importance of local traditions of, of resistance, the importance of African cultures. And, and those are the aspects that I think complement um, the narrative, the magnificent narrative that C.L.R. James gave us. Um, so it's not that I want to take anything away from, from C.L.R. James. I just think there are additional elements that one needs to, to bring to bear to, uh, to get the full measure of what an extraordinary story this is. Thanks very much, Sudhir. Uh, next question says, thank you for the excellent talk. You mentioned men and women who resisted. What was the role of women in the Haitian Revolution? It wasn't as great as it could have been um, because Louverture was quite a traditionalist when it came to um, gender roles. On the other hand, he didn't always control what was happening um, on the ground. And one of the things that I find is, is very striking is early, particularly early on, in the uh, 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 insurrection of the enslaved men and women after 1791, a lot of the leaders, leading figures in the um, in that insurrection are women, and uh, uh, and there are women in uh, in Toussaint's uh, army uh, early on as well, and you find the same phenomenon uh, in the War of National Liberation after 18 after 1802. Um, many of the kind of and and these are these have become national heroes in Haiti up to this day. Um, people like Sanité Belair um, played uh, a very important role in in sort of rallying um, uh, opinion against the French and and actually fighting um, fighting uh, fighting them on the ground. So women play an important role, I suppose, in the early and and, and later years of the Haitian Revolution. Um, but Louverture himself, when, when you think about his, I suppose, his social philosophy, he tended to be a bit more traditionalist. Thank you. Next question says, this is excellent and thought provoking. Please, how would you respond to views that Toussaint is merely a copy of a Roman hero if called Black Spartacus? Ah, yes. Um, I thought a lot about whether I should use that um, title, and um, and of course uh, uh, that kind of uh, one one can one can uh, one runs the risk of simply um, uh, 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 representing Toussaint as as an imitation, um, uh, as as the questioner implies. I think. I think the main reason why I chose it, well, there's two, there were two reasons, one perhaps less honorable than the other, but I'll give you both. Um, the less honorable reason is when you're writing a book like this for um, uh, a general audience, you want to have a title that will make the subject matter immediately accessible. 
And I'm afraid, you know, um, saying anything about the Haitian revolution in its own terms would not have achieved that effect for all the reasons that I've given you in this talk, which is that people don't know enough, unfortunately, about the Haitian revolution. So if I'd called him, you know, Toussaint had lots of nicknames during his life. So if the book had been called The Centaur of the Savannah, right, which was an, one of the names that he was known by, everybody would have said, great, but who is that? And, and who are we talking about, right? But with Black Spartacus, you immediately get the idea, right? And, and so the title was chosen uh, for that reason. On the other hand, um, and, and I think this weighed also a lot in my mind, this was a title which Toussaint himself used uh, in his literature, in his correspondence, in his speeches. Um, as far as I know, he was first compared to Spartacus by, um, by one of his great Republican, French Republican allies in 1796. Basically, there's a, there's a, there's a clash between this French uh, Republican governor and a group of uh, mixed race uh, 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 officers. And Toussaint comes to the, to the rescue of the French uh, Republican general and, um, and uh, 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 frees him. And, 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 and in the immediate aftermath of that, uh, this Republican general, a man called uh, Lavo, gives a speech where he hails Louverture as the black Spartacus who has come to uh, as predicted by the Abbe Reynal, because the, there's a whole backstory to this uh, 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 expression, Black Spartacus. Uh, Abbe Reynal and Diderot in their Histoire philosophique des deux Indes, which was published in the second half of the uh, 18th century, had, had written about slavery and, and, and how terrible it was and predicted that a liberator would emerge uh, to, to break the chains. Of, of enslavement. So Toussaint is very conscious of all of this. Um, but my point is that he's very comfortable with being described uh, in this way by his allies. And he's also quite proud of it. Um, you know, he's able to use it as uh, something which is to his advantage. And so given that, given that context, I think it's entirely appropriate to, to, use, uh, to use the expression. Thanks very much, Sudhir. Uh, next question says, given Britain's invasion of Saint-Domingue after the rebellion and growing calls in Britain for abolition, how was the rebellion viewed in Britain? Uh, thank you. That's a really um, uh, interesting and important story because um, on the one hand, this is actually a, a, a pretty dreadful story from the point of view of the British state because, you know, Despite his uh, uh, liberal credentials, you know, Pitt the Younger gives a speech in the House of Commons um, calling for the abolition of the slave trade. But from 1793 onwards, when um, there's an opportunity for the British to uh, get their hands on Saint-Domingue, they go in, um, you know, um, without any hesitation. And the British pour in something like you know, 10 million pounds worth uh, in terms of expenditure, they send in 20,000 troops, basically fighting Louverture and fighting his black army. And Toussaint defeats them and, uh, and kicks them out in 1798. So this is um, one of the many extraordinary uh, 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 military aspects um, of, of this story, right? The attempt by the British to... Um, to re-enslave um, uh, uh, the the, um, uh, the people of Saint Domingue, and it's it, it's even sadder that it's exactly the same thing that happens to the French just a few years later. You know, um, imperial imperial forces never seem to learn from the mistakes of their predecessors, and and, and that story continues over and over again. Um, but What's really interesting is that when you look at um, the more enlightened um, uh, uh, aspects of British public opinion and, and the more enlightened uh, 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 newspapers in Britain, Toussaint is being described as um, uh, uh, a very, described very positively in, in the British press. Um, they would uh, describe his victories against the, um, 
the uh, the Spaniards, for example, and talk very positively about uh, the economic relationships that he built with um, with the Americans. And from 1798 onwards, Toussaint, because he's very um, uh, smart, he realizes that as soon as he defeats the British militarily, he needs to reach out to them politically because um, he needs he needs British support if he is to be able to trade effectively with the neighbors because Britain still commands um, the, the high seas. So he signs an economic treaty with the Brits in 1798 and 1799. And that is very favorably uh, described in the British press. So by the time he's, by the time we get to 1801, 1802, in some British newspapers, Toussaint is being described as the man of the year, you know. So, so he's, and that is remarkable too. Thank you. Next question says, wonderful talk. Whites in Guadeloupe and Martinique still dominate the economy, etc. Was Dessalines right and Toussaint wrong in the view of what was possible with white people? Well, uh, it's, uh, um, it's interesting when I talk to people in Haiti, um, that, that, that debate, you know, are you, are you with Toussaint or are you with, are you with Dessalines? It, it's framed in exactly these terms. And, and when, you're in, when you're in Haiti and when you see what the French have done to Haiti, not just what they did to it before uh, the revolution, but what they did to it after and what they continue to do to it now in, in terms of their denial, you can understand why. Um, basically a lot of people in Haiti and, and in the French Caribbean more generally think that um, you know metropolitan France is not to be trusted. And I think it is about trust, right? Because one of the things that is so devastating about the history of this relationship is how many times the uh, French have made pledges um, of a, lib of a liberating, you were glowing there, Richard, which was really interesting. Um, how many times the French have made pledges of various kinds about emancipation, about um, greater integration, about social justice and fail to live up to them. So I think what this really tells us and, and you know, as we're speaking, there are, there are uh, people protesting in, in, in Martinique, in Guadeloupe, and I think there's a general strike that's been called in Martinique. What this speaks to is just the, the, the absolutely catastrophic way in which the French have handled, not just their post-colonial relationships, because it's still in a mess, but also their relationships with their, their existing colonies. They don't call them colonies anymore. These are departments and territories. But when you go to them, you see a, a tremendous sense of resentment part of which is grounded in these historic injustices, which your, quest which your question had talked about. Thanks very much. Yes, the, uh, the audience was spared the sight of the lights going off in the room that I'm sitting in and me looking slightly ghoulish and threatening. So go back to, I may still look threatening, but it's, it's back to normal light. The next question today is, what are your thoughts about the language of reconciliation in countries like Haiti, when the extent of destruction across generations has been so profound? Well, it, it's very difficult. And um, I, think, I think it's partly about, it's partly about processes. And, and of course, um, all the great work that you're doing at the Institute um, you know, um, shines a light on this. I think when you can set up, um, in other words, this isn't just about material things. Um, you know, if, if you can create a process in which people can talk to each other, can, can express their grief, um, can, uh, uh, can apologize to each other, um, you know, th that sort of truth and reconciliation type of process which the South Africans um, uh, carried out, which was far from perfect, but I think it is an example of the kind of thing that you can do. But of course, you have to have willing parties across the board. And, and for the moment, you can't do it properly in, in a place like Haiti because the French would refuse to participate in it in a, in, a, in a proper way, right? So it can only work if all the parties are willing to uh, uh, recognize and abide by the, the, the common framework. 
We've got many, many questions, but because of time, this will have to be the last one, Sudhir. Um, do you think that the Haitian Revolution should be taught in French schools on par with the French Revolution as part of the two-way decolonization process? Thank you. That's a really great question because I've been doing some work with uh, a French uh, association called the Fondation pour la Mémoire de l'Esclavage, which is presided by uh, François Hollande's former prime minister. And, um, and what, um, what they're trying to do is exactly this, to try and uh, uh, reintegrate the story of the Haitian Revolution into the uh, school curriculum because we've reached this extraordinary situation in France now, the land of Republican equality, where um, you can only learn about the Haitian Revolution in secondary schools if you are in the uh, Département et Territoire d'Outre-mer. If, if you're in metropolitan France, you don't learn about the Haitian Revolution. And uh, that is very unfortunate. And, um, and, and I think getting, getting everybody to the stage where, where they're learning a shared history, I think will be absolutely uh, essential if we're going to uh, be able to achieve this you know, important objective of getting the French to face, face up to their own history again. So there you can tell by the range and intensity of the questions how fascinated people have been in the Mitchell Institute hearing you tonight. It's time to bring this session to a close with uh, three words of thanks. I'd like to thank the audience uh, for their attendance, for the breadth and intensity and insights of the questions. It's great to have that range of engagement. Sorry we couldn't get through them all, but we got through as many as we could. Second, I'd like to thank colleagues in the Mitchell Institute and in the Vice Chancellor's Office here at Queen's University Belfast for organising the event so well but particularly and most emphatically for a brilliant lecture about a brilliant book and for a wonderful fielding of questions. I know that everybody, Sudhir, will want to join me in profoundly thanking you for a great evening tonight. We'd love to get you to Belfast in person when times allow for that. But for now, and for a brilliant lecture, many thanks to Dr. Sudhir Hazarizin. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>